Chapter 3 of The Mysterious Stranger by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysterious Stranger and Other Stories by Mark Twain. Chapter 3 The stranger had seen everything, he had been everywhere, he knew everything and he forgot nothing. What another must study, he learned at a glance. There were no difficulties for him, and he made things live before you when he told about them. He saw the world made. He saw Adam created. He saw Samson surge against the pillars and bring the temple down in ruins about him. He saw Caesar's death. He told of the daily life in heaven. He had seen the damned writhing in the red waves of hell, and he made us see all these things. And it was as if we were on the spot and looking at them with our own eyes, and we felt them too, but there was no sign that they were anything to him beyond mere entertainments. Those visions of hell, those poor babes and women and girls and lads and men shrieking and supplicating in anguish, why, we could hardly bear it, but he was as bland about it as if it had been so many imitation rats in an artificial fire. And always, when he was talking about men and women here on earth, and their doings, even their grandest and sublimest, we were secretly ashamed, for his manner showed that to him they and their doings were of paltry poor consequence. Often you would think he was talking about flies, if you didn't know. Once he even said in so many words that our people down here were quite interesting to him, notwithstanding they were so dull and ignorant and trivial and conceited, and so diseased and rickety, and such a shabby, poor, worthless lot all around. He said it in a quite matter-of-course way, and without bitterness, just as a person might talk about bricks or manure or any other thing that was of no consequence and hadn't feelings. I could see he meant no offense, but in my thoughts I set it down as not very good manners. Manners, he said, why, it is merely the truth, and truth is good manners. Manners are a fiction. The castle is done. Do you like it? Any one would have been obliged to like it. It was lovely to look at. It was so shapely and fine, and so cunningly perfect in all its particulars, even to the little flags waving from the turrets. Satan said we must put the artillery in place now, and station the halberdiers, and display the cavalry. Our men and horses were a spectacle to see. They were so little like what they were intended for, for, of course, we had no art in making such things. Satan said they were the worst he had seen, and when he touched them and made them alive, it was just ridiculous the way they acted, on account of their legs not being of uniform lengths. They reeled and sprawled around as if they were drunk, and endangered everybody's lives around them, and finally fell over and lay helpless and kicking. It made us all laugh, though it was a shameful thing to see. The guns were charged with dirt to fire a salute, but they were so crooked and so badly made that they all burst when they went off, and killed some of the gunners and crippled the others. Satan said we would have a storm now, and an earthquake if we liked, but we must stand off a piece out of danger. We wanted to call the people away, too, but he said never mind them, they were of no consequence, and we could make more some time or other if we needed them. A small storm-cloud began to settle down black over the castle, and the miniature lighting and thunder began to play, and the ground to quiver, and the wind to pipe and wheeze, and the rain to fall, and all the people flocked into the castle for shelter. The cloud settled down blacker and blacker, and one could see the castle only dimly through it. The lightning blazed out flash upon flash, and pierced the castle, and set it on fire, and the flames shone out red and fierce through the cloud, and the people came flying out, shrieking, but Satan brushed them back, paying no attention to our begging and crying and imploring, and in the midst of the howling of the wind and volleying of the thunder, the magazine blew up. 
the earthquake rent the ground wide, and the castle's wreck and ruin tumbled into the chasm, which swallowed it from sight, and closed upon it, with all that innocent life, not one of the five hundred poor creatures escaping. Our hearts were broken. We could not keep from crying. Don't cry, Satan said. They were of no value. But they are gone to hell. Oh, it is no matter. We can make plenty more. It was of no use to try to move him. Evidently he was wholly without feeling and could not understand. He was full of bubbling spirits, and as gay as if this were a wedding instead of a fiendish massacre, and he was bent on making us feel as he did, and of course his magic accomplished his desire. It was no trouble to him. He did whatever he pleased with us. In a little while we were dancing on that grave, and he was playing to us on a strange sweet instrument which he took out of his pocket, and the music but there is no music like that, unless perhaps in heaven, and that was where he brought it from, he said. It made one mad for pleasure, and we could not take our eyes from him, and the look that went out of our eyes came from our hearts, and their dumb speech was worship. He brought the dance from heaven, too, and the bliss of paradise was in it. Presently he said he must go away on an errand, but we could not bear the thought of it, and clung to him, and pleaded with him to stay, and that pleased him, and he said so, and said he would not go yet, but would wait a little while, and we would sit down and talk a few minutes longer. And he told us Satan was only his real name, and he was to be known by it to us alone, but he had chosen another one to be called in the presence of others, just a common one such as people have, Philip Traum. It sounded so odd and mean for such a being, but it was his decision, and we said nothing. His decision was sufficient. We had seen wonders this day, and my thoughts began to run on the pleasure it would be to tell them when I got home, but he noticed those thoughts and said, No, all these matters are a secret among us four. I do not mind your trying to tell them, if you like, but I will protect your tongues and nothing of the secret will escape from them. It was a disappointment, but it couldn't be helped, and it cost us a sigh or two. We talked pleasantly along, and he was always reading our thoughts and responding to them, and it seemed to me that this was the most wonderful of all the things he did. But he interrupted my musings and said, No, it would be wonderful for you, but it is not wonderful for me. I am not limited like you. I am not subject to human conditions. I can measure and understand your human weaknesses, for I have studied them, but I have none of them. My flesh is not real, although it would seem firm to your touch. My clothes are not real. I am a spirit. Father Peter is coming. We looked around, but did not see any one. He is not in sight yet. But you will see him presently. Do you know him, Satan? No. Won't you talk with him when he comes? He is not ignorant and dull like us, and he would so like to talk with you. Will you? Another time, yes, but not now. I must go on my errand after a little. There he is now. You can see him. Sit still and don't say anything. We looked up and saw Father Peter approaching through the chestnuts. We three were sitting together in the grass, and Satan sat in front of us in the path. Father Peter came slowly along with his head down, thinking, and stopped within a couple yards of us, and took off his hat, and got out his silk handkerchief, and stood there mopping his face, and looking as if he were going to speak to us. But he didn't. Presently he muttered, "'I can't think what brought me here.' It seems as if I were in my study a minute ago, but I suppose I have been dreaming along for an hour, and have come all this stretch without noticing, for I am not myself in these troubled days. Then he went, mumbling along to himself, and walked straight through Satan, just as if nothing were there. It made us catch our breath to see it. We had the impulse to cry out, the way you nearly always do when a startling thing happens, but something mysteriously restrained us, and we remained quiet, only breathing fast. 
Then the trees hid Father Peter after a little, and Satan said, It is as I told you. I am only a spirit. Yes, one perceives it now, said Nicholas, but we are not spirits. It is plain he did not see you. But were we invisible too? He looked at us, but he didn't seem to see us. No, none of us was visible to him, for I wished it so. It seemed almost too good to be true that we were actually seeing these romantic and wonderful things, and that it was not a dream. And there he sat, looking just like anybody, so natural and simple and charming, and chatting along again the same as ever, and, well, words cannot make you understand what we felt. It was an ecstasy. And an ecstasy is a thing that will not go into words. It feels like music, and one cannot tell about music so that another person can get the feeling of it. He was back in the old ages once more now, and making them live before us. He had seen so much, so much. It was just a wonder to look at him and try to think how it must seem to have such experience behind one but it made you seem sorrowfully trivial, and the creature of a day, and such a short and paltry day, too, and he didn't say anything to raise up your drooping pride, no, not a word. He always spoke of men in the same old indifferent way, just as one speaks of bricks and manure piles and such things. You could see that they were of no consequence to him, one way or the other, he didn't mean to hurt us, you could see that, just as we don't mean to insult a brick when we disparage it. A brick's emotions are nothing to us. It never occurs to us to think whether it has any or not. Once, when he was bunching the most illustrious kings and conquerors and poets and prophets and pirates and beggars together, just a brick pile, I was shamed into putting in a word for man and asked him why he made so much difference between men and himself. He had to struggle with that a moment. He didn't seem to understand how I could ask such a strange question. Then he said, The difference between man and me. The difference between a mortal and an immortal, between a cloud and a spirit. He picked up a woodlouse that was creeping along a piece of bark. What is the difference between Caesar and this? I said one cannot compare things which by their nature and by the interval between them are not comparable. You have answered your own question, he said. I will expand it. Man is made of dirt. I saw him made. I am not made of dirt. Man is a museum of diseases, a home of impurities. He comes to-day and is gone to-morrow. He begins as dirt and departs as stench. I am of the aristocracy of the imperishables. And man has the moral sense. You understand, he has the moral sense. That would seem to be difference enough between us all by itself. He stopped there, as if that settled the matter. I was sorry, for at that time I had but a dim idea of what the moral sense was. I merely knew that we were proud of having it. And when he talked like that about it, it wounded me, and I felt as a girl feels who thinks her dearest finery is being admired, and then overhears strangers making fun of it. For a while we were all silent, and I for one was depressed. Then Satan began to chat again, and soon he was sparkling along in such a cheerful and vivacious vein that my spirits rose once more. He told some very cunning things that put us in a gale of laughter, and when he was telling about the time that Samson tied the torches to the foxes' tails and set them loose in the Philistines' corn, and Samson sitting on the fence, slapping his thighs and laughing, with the tears running down his cheeks, and lost his balance and fell off the fence, the memory of that picture got him to laughing too, and we did have a most lovely and jolly time. By and by he said, I am going on my errand now. 
don't we all said don't go stay with us you won't come back yes i will i give you my word when to-night say when it won't be long you will see we like you and i you and as a proof of it i will show you something fine to see usually when i go i merely vanish but now i will dissolve myself and let you see me do it he stood up and it was quickly finished he thinned away and thinned away until he was a soap bubble except that he kept his shape you could see the bushes through him as clearly as you see things through a soap bubble and all over him played and flashed the delicate iridescent colors of the bubble and along with them was that thing shaped like a window sash which you always see on the globe of the bubble you have seen a bubble strike the carpet and lightly bound along two or three times before it bursts he did that he sprang touched the grass bounded floated along touched again and so on and presently exploded poof and in his place was vacancy it was a strange and beautiful thing to see we did not say anything but sat wondering and dreaming and blinking and finally seppi roused up and said mournfully sighing i suppose none of it has happened nicholas sighed and said about the same i was miserable to hear them say it for it was the same cold fear that was in my own mind then we saw poor old father peter wandering along back with his head bent down searching the ground when he was pretty close to us he looked up and saw us and said how long have you been here boys a little while father then it is since i came by and maybe you can help me did you come up by the path yes father that is good i came the same way i have lost my wallet there wasn't much in it but very little is much to me for it was all i had i suppose you haven't seen anything of it no father but we will help you hunt that is what i was going to ask you oh why here it is we hadn't noticed it yet there it lay right where satan stood when he began to melt if he did melt and it wasn't a delusion father peter picked it up and looked very much surprised it is mine he said but not the contents this is fat mine was flat mine was light this is heavy he opened it it was stuffed as full as it could hold with gold coins he let us gaze our fill and of course we did gaze for we had never seen so much money at one time before all our mouths came open to say satan did it but nothing came out there it was you see we couldn't tell what satan didn't want told he had said so himself boys did you do this it made us laugh and it made him laugh too as soon as he thought what a foolish question it was who has been here our mouths came open to answer but stood so for a moment because we couldn't say nobody for it wouldn't be true and the right word didn't seem to come and then i thought of the right one and said it not a human being that is so said the others and let their mouths go shut it is not so said father peter and looked at us very severely i came by here a while ago and there was no one here but that is nothing some one has been here since i don't mean to say that the person didn't pass here before you came and i don't mean to say you saw him but some one did pass that i know on your honor you saw no one not a human being that is sufficient i know you are telling me the truth he began to count the money on the path we on our knees eagerly helping to stack it in little piles it's eleven hundred ducats odd he said oh dear if it were only mine and i need it so and his voice broke and his lips quivered it is yours sir we all cried out at once every heller no it isn't mine only four ducats are mine the rest he fell to dreaming poor old soul and caressed some of the coins in his hands and forgot where he was sitting there on his heels with his old gray head bare it was pitiful to see no he said waking up it isn't mine i can't account for it i think some enemy it must be a trap 
Nicholas said, Father Peter, with the exception of the astrologer, you haven't a real enemy in the village, nor Margaret either, and not even a half-enemy that's rich enough to chance eleven hundred ducats to do you a mean turn. I'll ask you if that's so or not. He couldn't get around that argument, and it cheered him up. But it isn't mine, you see. It, it isn't mine in any case. He said it in a wistful way, like a person that wouldn't be sorry, but glad, if anybody would contradict him. It is yours, Father Peter, and we are witness to it, aren't we, boys? Yes, we are, and we'll stand by it, too. Bless your hearts, you almost persuade me, you do indeed, if I had only a hundred odd ducats of it. The house is mortgaged for it, and we've no home for our heads if we don't pay to-morrow and that four ducats is all we've got in the it's yours every bit of it and you've got to take it we are bail that it's all right aren't we theodore aren't we seppi we two said yes and nicholas stuffed the money back into the shabby old wallet and made the owner take it so he said he would use two hundred of it for his house was good enough security for that and would put the rest at interest till the rightful owner came for it and on our side we must sign a paper showing how he got the money, a paper to show to the villagers as proof that he had not got out of his troubles dishonestly. End chapter 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Mysterious Stranger by Mark Twain. Read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during March 2008.